nothing but the truth. Hello, I'm Raj Chengappa from India Today and your host for Nothing But The Truth. Every week, we will deal with key issues of concern and bring you perspectives and clarity as to why these matter to you and what is the clear truth that emerges. The political battle for Karnataka is now in its home stretch. The polling for the assembly election is due on May 10th. The two main contenders, the Bharatiya Janta Party or the BJP and the Indian National Congress are engaged in a fierce fight to the finish. Now, Karnataka is my home state and recently I spent several days talking to key members from all the major parties apart from political experts to assess the situation. These are some of my findings. Firstly, it is clear that the stakes are extremely high for both the national parties. For the BJP, Karnataka is the only southern state which it is currently ruling. Now, of the 130 Lok Sabha seats in the six southern states, namely Karnataka, Andhra Pradesh, Telangana, Kerala, Tamil Nadu and Puducherry, the BJP has just 29 seats. Out of that, 25 Lok Sabha seats from, come from Karnataka alone. They have just four seats from the other five southern states. Again, barring Karnataka, the BJP is a minor player in the state assemblies in all the other five states. So for the BJP, a win in Karnataka will firstly boost its campaign in neighboring Telangana. Telangana goes to the polls this December. It will also give the BJP a positive momentum needed for the 2024 general election. I met Chief Minister Baswaraj Bommai at his house in Bengaluru and he chatted with me over a breakfast of dosa, vade and idli, the South Indian fare. Among the questions that I asked him is what is the importance of Karnataka elections for the two main parts? His perceptive answer was, and I quote him, Karnataka is a do or die election for the Congress and for the BJP, it is a must win battle. Prime Minister Narendra Modi met Baswaraj Bomai just before the election campaign and reportedly asked his chief minister, how are you feeling about the election? When Bomai said he felt confident, Prime Minister Modi persisted and asked him, are you very confident, overconfident, or carefully confident? Bomai replied, I am carefully confident. To which the Prime Minister told him, you have a very big task on your hand. The Prime Minister then advised Bumai to be well prepared and plan the party's electoral strategy right to the micro level. Bumai is well aware of the challenges. The odds for the BJP to retain power in this crucial southern states are stacked against him. It has been over 38 years since an incumbent government in the state was voted back to power. Bumai and the BJP hope to buck that trend. Behind Burmai's affable demeanor lies a shrewd and meticulous mind. The chief minister is acutely aware that despite the BJP having two major shots at ruling the state in the past 15 years, this of course includes his own tenure. When it came to total seats, BJP has never won a majority on its own in the assembly election. The maximum the BJP secured was 110 seats in 2008 three short of a, of a simple majority of 113 needed in the 224 State Assembly. I then met Siddharamaya, the Congress leader who was Chief Minister of Karnataka from 2013 to 2018. Siddharamaya was dressed in a white kurta and had his uh, trademark stubble beard. He had a crowd of party workers seated with him, but unmindful of them, he spoke candidly to me. When I asked him how he saw this election, he told me, and I quote him, the BJP's aim is to win in South India. But for us in the Congress, from a national perspective, we must protect our strength in Karnataka by winning the election. A win in Karnataka will lead to the Congress revival at the national level and be a stepping stone for the 2024 general election for the Congress. Now let's look at the key factors that could determine the outcome of the elections. Among them is the leadership dilemma that has impacted both parties. Neither the BJP nor the Congress has declared who would be its next chief minister if they won the election. In the BJP, Burmai supporters believe that in the event of a victory, 
he will be the party's natural choice. Bhumai belongs to the Lingayat community, which makes up around 17% of the electorate and wields influence across 70 constituencies. Bhumai took over as Chief Minister in July 2021, when the then Chief Minister, B.S. Yadurappa, stepped down as he was nearing 80 years of age. Yadurappa is a Lingayat and is considered one of its most prominent leaders. One of the major reasons the party chose Bhumai as his replacement was to ensure that the Lingayat vote stayed with the BJP. The Congress party too has to sort out the leadership tangle between Siddharamaya and D.K. Shivakuma, the president of the Karnataka Pradesh Congress Committee or KPCC. Sporting a salt and pepper beard, the 60-year-old Shivakuma is the Congress's go-to man in a crisis. Belonging to the dominant Vokliga community, he has had an unbroken run as a seven-time MLA from constituencies in Bangalore rural. I spoke to Shivakuma when he was on his way to take a helicopter flight for a campaign rally and asked him what he thought the key issues in this election were. Shivakuma told me, and I quote him, all sections of the society in the state are agitated. The ruling BJP has never made any attempt to satisfy their needs. It came out with so many promises but has not been able to deliver on them. All is not well with the BJP, he said. Where Shivakuma is brimming with energy, Siddharamaya exudes quiet confidence and sagacity. Siddharamaya has crafted his political image as a leader of the backward classes and is a good speaker with a common touch. The Congress must tread carefully on the leadership issue because Shivakuma believes it is his turn now to get the top job if the party wins. So far, both leaders have kept their ambitions and tempers in control, with each acknowledging that the party MLAs should decide who the chief minister should be. Also, as a senior Congress leader pointed out to me, and I quote him, if there is a facade of unity, it is because neither of them has the capacity to break away from the Congress and run a party on his own. So, overall, the party is broadly united and is relatively a cohesive machine. Now let's look at the individual strategies of both the main parties. When the BJP top brass analyzed its poll prospects, the feedback they got was that the perceived lack of good governance was an issue. There was also anti-incumbency, particularly against many of the sitting BJP MLAs. The party's other worry was that while the formidable Lingayat community remained committed to it, to get a clear majority, the BJP would have to get the support of other caste groups as well. The Hindutva card was mainly useful in coastal Karnataka, where the hijab and the halal controversy had erupted. There, the BJP is sure of bagging almost all the 19 seats. Pushing the polarization game to other districts was, however, considered counterproductive. A key prong of the BJP strategy is what the party seniors euphemistically call social engineering. It essentially means playing the caste and the reservation cards. The first move by the BJP came in October 2022, nearly eight months before the polls, when the BJP government promulgated an ordinance to increase reservation in education and employment for the scheduled castes by 2% and for the scheduled tribes by 4%. The BJP hopes the goodwill earned by implementing this long-standing demand will enable them to win votes among both the scheduled castes and scheduled tribes who are settled mostly in Kalyana, Karnataka or the districts adjoining Hyderabad. The most contentious move, however, came just before the Election Commission of India announced the dates for the polls and the model code of conduct kicked in. The Burmai government scrapped the OBC reservation for Muslims and redistributed the 4% quota, thus freed up to the Lingayats and the Vokligas. These are the state's two prominent communities that were demanding an increase in reservation. In doing so, the BJP was hoping to win more support from the two major communities, even while playing its Hindutva card. But with the matter now being heard by the Supreme Court, the Karnataka government has put that order on hold. The Congress accuses the BJP of snatching away the reservation given to Muslims as a ploy to polarize communities ahead of the election. The Congress expects the Muslim vote, which amounts to 13% of the state, to consolidate completely in its favor. The party also has a rainbow coalition of castes with it, called AHINDA, a Kannada acronym, 
It seeks a coalition from backward classes, Dalits and the minorities, and this remains the party's core strength. Sidharamaya is a Kuruba, a dominant OBC group in the state, which has around 7% of the votes. The Congress's uh, party national uh, president, Malikarjun Karge, is a Dalit. Now, this community has a 17% vote share in the state. In Shivakuma, who is a Vakliga, they also have a recognized leader among this powerful community that makes up around 12% of the electorate. The community that the Congress needs to focus on is the Lingayats, uh, who have, in recent elections, backed the BJP fully. In this election, the Congress has given tickets to 51 Lingayat candidates, an increase of eight seats over the previous elections. Meanwhile, with anti-incumbency remaining a major issue for the BJP, the party made several moves to counter it. Among the most important was that they replaced 20 sitting MLAs with new candidates and brought in fresh faces overall in about 80 constituencies. Now that's more than a third of the seats that the BJP is contesting. As a party insider told me, and I quote him, even though making a generational change like this is a risk, the Prime Minister insisted that we do it because he said we can't wait for everything to fall into place. We should be the change we want to be. But in the aftermath of these moves by the BJP, there were a few shocks for the party. Senior leader and former Chief Minister Jagdish Shatar switched over to the Congress when he was denied the party ticket from the Hubli Darwad Central constituency. Also, Lakshman Savadi, a former Deputy Chief Minister who was overlooked for the ticket to the Athani constituency in Belgavi, quit the BJP and joined the Congress. Both are Lingayats, which meant their exits had the BJP scrambling to manage the optics, given that the Lingayats have been their mainstay in Karnataka. Yadurappa, the tallest Lingayat leader, had to be called in for damage control. He told India Today, and I'm quoting him, after Shetta went away, from the BJP, none of the, his followers who are elected members went and followed him. Not even a single person. Believe it or not, he told me, Shetta himself is going to lose. Now let's look at the issues being raised during the campaign. The Congress has focused on the perception that under the BJP government, corruption increased considerably. For the past year and a half, the label of 40% Commission Sarkar has dogged the Burmai government. This allegation was made by a state contractors association in a letter to the Prime Minister's office. In it, they alleged they had to now pay 40% in bribes to win award or to win the award for government project tenders. What made matters worse for the ruling party was that in March this year, the state's Lokayukta had a BJP MLA, KM Virupakshappa, arrested in a corruption case. Chief Minister Bomai denies the 40% charge, saying the contractors who raised the complaint have provided no evidence yet. He also told me that he has put a system in place to ensure tenders are transparent and corruption is curbed. Bumai went on to accuse the previous Congress regime headed by Siddharamaya as being totally corrupt and that his government had filed several cases against him. To which Siddharamaya retorts, and I'm quoting him, did they raise any scam during my tenure? If they are doing it now, can you believe it? They were in power for four years. Why didn't they do or put an inquiry into these charges? The Congress is also milking the Nandini versus Amul issue and using it to invoke Kannadiga pride. Nandini is the brand name for the milk being sold by the Karnataka Milk Federation and is highly popular across the state. The controversy began in December when Amit Shah, who apart from being the Union Home Minister is also Minister for Cooperation, inaugurated a mega diary in Mandya district. In that meeting, Shah spoke about how Amul and Nandini will work together towards establishing primary diaries in every village in Karnataka. This led to a furor, a possible Gujarati takeover of a Karnataka enterprise. Siddharamaya accused the Modi government of trying to impose a one nation, one milk policy and said it would put the state's 2.6 million milk farmers at a disadvantage and that they should be protected. The BJP rushed to control the damage 
with Karnataka Cooperation Minister S.T. Somashekar saying that no such merger was on the cards. The minister also pointed out that Amul was only selling its milk via e-commerce at Rs 57 a litre while Nandini was far cheaper at Rs 39 a litre in outlets and therefore there was no competition. Meanwhile, the BJP's major election plank is the massive welfare schemes that both the state and central governments have launched. The party is using these to claim that these have impacted almost every section of society and to underline the benefits of a double-engine Sarkar. Bumai told me, and I quote him, the overall, the double-engine schemes have covered over five crore beneficiaries of Karnataka in a population that is a total of six crores. We are confident, he said, that this alone will enable us to be re-elected. The Congress party, while making price rise, corruption and unemployment its three main campaign issues, joined the welfare game too. The party announced four guarantees to voters. The first, free electricity of up to 200 units for every household. The second, rupees 2,000 monthly allowance for every woman who's uh, the head of her, her family. The third, doubling the free distribution of rice for below the poverty line families to 10 kgs. And the fourth, a monthly allowance of rupees 3,000 for unemployed graduates and rupees 1,500 for diploma holders for a two-year period. Even as these two major parties slug it out, there is a third political party that they need to watch out for. This is the Janata Dal Secular, or JDS for short, that was started by former Prime Minister H.D. Devagada, who was also a former Karnataka Chief Minister. JDS is a force to reckon with uh, within the old Mysore region, which accounts for 67 seats. In addition to getting around 18 to 20 percent of the vote, uh, it wins 30 to 40 seats on an average in the state. These numbers become important. Uh, neither of the two big parties, the Congress and the BJP, gets a majority of the seats on their own, and as has been the case in the recent past. The JDS then emerges as the kingmaker, and at times, its leader, H.D. Kumaraswamy, the son of Devagada, even becomes the king. In 2006 and 2018, even though the JDS won just 58 and 40 seats respectively, Kumaraswamy was anointed chief minister after joining hands once with the BJP and then with the Congress. Both these tenures, though, lasted barely two years in all. The JDS's election campaign is built around five welfare themes. They call it the Pancharatna, and these are affordable education, health, agriculture, employment, and housing. However, weighing the party down are allegations that it remains heavily reliant on the Deva Gauda family. But the BJP and the Congress remain wary of the JDS. They really worry about them stealing the thunder again and are working towards getting a decisive verdict in this election. The X factor in these elections is Prime Minister Narendra Modi and the kind of impact his blitzkrieg campaign in the state will have on the fortunes of the BJP. BJP strategists claim that their government's welfare measures have helped the party boost its seat expectations to around 100 seats right now. They are hoping that Prime Minister Modi's campaign will boost the party's tally beyond the figure of 113 seats required for a simple majority. Now let's look at what Sophologists predict about the outcome. Sophologist Sandeep Shastri of Lokniti CSDS believes that while the Prime Minister's blitzkrieg of roadshows in the state is unprecedented, local issues will influence Karnataka voters more. Shastri told me that voters have routinely exhibited this dichotomy of voting for one party in the state and a different one in the general election. Another reputed pollster whom I spoke to was Yashwan Deshmukh, the founder-director of Sea Water. Deshmukh told me that his daily tracker for Karnataka shows that the Congress still has the edge and gives the Congress anything between 105 to uh, 125 seats. Now remember, 113 seats is required for a majority. Deshmukh gives the BJP around 80 seats and the JDS around 30 seats. Deshmukh told me that there are two reasons why the Congress remains the frontrunner. And I quote him. The first, there is an emotion for change. And he says, what we are seeing is a routine anti-incumbency against the BJP government. The other factor 
is that the Congress has a strong alternative leader like Siddharamaya. Deshmukh concedes that by bringing in fresh faces, the BJP has been able to soften the impact of anti-incumbency. He thinks Modi's carpet bombing campaign may help improve the BJP's prospects and as he puts it, the Prime Minister is known to hit an electoral equivalent of a six, even off the back foot. Sophologist Pradeep Gupta of Access My India, whose poll predictions are usually bang on, has a different take. And when I spoke to him, he said he believes that Karnataka, being a relatively prosperous state, welfare measures have limited appeal for voters. He said a larger percentage of voters hope for rapid development of infrastructure and amenities that in turn create employment. Pradeep believes that any party that focuses on an expansive vision of Karnataka is more likely to gain traction with voters rather than those that just focus on grouses like prices, price rise and unemployment. Pradeep says that and he believes that since the 2018 polls produced a hung house and a real mishmash of a government, the Karnataka voter is likely to give one party a clear mandate this time rather than the unstable coalitions they produced earlier. But Pradeep is reluctant to hazard a guess and says, when I asked him who the winner will be, he said it's still a tough fight. So you and I will have to wait for the results to be announced on May 13th to know who gets to rule this politically and economically important southern state. For more details, you can read the cover story in India Today magazine on the Karnataka elections, which I have written along with my colleague Ajay Sukumaran. Thank you for listening to this episode of Nothing But The Truth. I look forward to having you with me again next week. Nothing But The Truth.